Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. This is where we're hoping to give you a unique insight into life at the Vitality Stadium and beyond. I'm Chris Temple, match commentator on the Cherries for BBC Radio Solent and AFCB TV. And alongside me for this episode, I'm delighted to be reunited with my partner in crime from our former life on the preview show, Zoe Rundle. Zoe, hi. Hello, Chris. It's lovely to be back alongside you. Have you been coping okay without having to listen to me ramble on every Friday on the preview show? (laughs) Do you know, it's been a a lot's changed since we were doing the the preview show last year. You know, a lot of uh, different players come in, players going differently, different manager, of course. Absolutely. And of course, uh, most recently, fans back in as well. Fans back in. How good was it? I mean, as we're recording this, that game against Huddersfield was just a few days ago, but it was absolutely brilliant. And that performance, it had everything. It had individual goals, it had team goals, it had a clean sheet, debuts, and of course, the fans. What more could you ask for? And it's surprising how much noise, a small amount of... It was only 1,200 for the first game, of course, going up from there, but how much noise they can make. And to be honest, watching back the highlights on AFCB TV, you actually wouldn't know it wasn't a full stadium, would you, for the roar when the goals went in? Yeah, I mean, the fans, they were brilliant and for them it must have been such an amazing moment because we've been so lucky that we've been able to go to games over the last few months and for them to be back in the stadium and to be back at home is is amazing and, and as we said what a performance they had I don't know about you, but I got some goosebumps when the team came out to the reception they got as well in the uh, the first game back for sure. When it was, uh, I guess, us remembering what it was like, and I've got to say, on the radio, it just makes such a, a huge difference as well to have a bit of a a bit of a soundtrack in the background. Um, no let up, of course, as ever in the championship fixture schedule at the moment. But with you supporters now returning to the stadium slowly but surely, we know not all of you have had the opportunity so far to to come back, but hopefully you will do shortly uh, this season. Hopefully continuing on an upward path. Now, in episode one of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, we chatted to the club's technical director, Richard Hughes, who gave us an insight into his role and to recruitment operations here at the stadium. That episode, of course, is available to listen to still in our back catalogue, and it won't be too hard to find because it is the only episode in our back catalogue. This, of course, being the brand new official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Today, in episode two, we're delighted to be able to take you inside the dressing room. I was going to start teasing his identity with some of his career stats, but then I realised you've clicked on his name to listen to this podcast anyway. So it's a big welcome to a man usually found mesmerising defenders or banging in goals, Arnout Danjuma. Arnout, welcome to the official (laughs) AFC Bournemouth podcast. Thank you, thank you. Um, Let's start, shall we, with the fact that we unfortunately haven't seen you on the pitch in uh, the last few weeks. Um, Obviously, you've had a a bit of an injury issue. Just, Just bring us up to date with A, how the injury is, and B, how frustrating it's been having started the season so well. Um, it's getting better by each day, uh, making a lot of progress. Um, I won't be out for too long, um, but obviously it's, it's frustrating to be out. Um, although we've been, win- we've been winning games, uh, so that's, that, that makes me happy. Obviously, we need to stay at, top, at the top of the table. Um, but yeah, on the other hand, you would always like to be a part of the team and um, be involved in winning games. So it's always frustrating being out. Particularly when you put together your best run of form since you came to the club as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Um, yeah, I've been I've I've been performing well, um, if I if I can say so. I've been performing well, yeah. Um, so being out just is very frustrating for me. Um, but then again, I mean, I can only focus on my rehab right now and make sure that uh, I make the best out of it and make sure that I come back twice as hard. How good are you at watching, particularly when you know you'd love to be out Too there? Bad. Really? <laughs> <laughs> if I need to be really honest, like I I'm I'm not even watching all the games uh, because if I if I'm if I'm watching the out, get so frustrated that I'm not playing. So uh, I've, I've I always watch with one eye closed. <laughs> Does it make you nervous when you're watching? Because obviously when you're in the game, you're there, you're playing it, you can impact it. But when you're watching, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say particularly nervous, but it just gets me frustrated because I'm watching the game, you want them to win. Um, then there are certain moments where I think, ah, if I was playing, I would do this, I would do that. <laughs> if I get the ball here, I would do this. Um, so yeah, it, it, it just gets me frustrated. So that's why I watch a game every now and then. You know, we're scoring a lot of goals. We're playing a lot of really good attacking football. Yeah. Obviously, you've scored five goals yourself this season. What's it like, you know, when you're, you're seeing all your teammates score these goals, some brilliant goals on Saturday as well against Nah, Nah, that's, 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 that makes me happy as well. I mean, uh, I have a good relationship with the lads. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned, I want them to do good as well. And I hope they want me to do good as well. <laughs> so the more, sc- the more goals we score, uh, the better, obviously, we need to win. And it's, it's a team sport, a team performance. So it's all good. We'll go back a little bit in a, in a moment, Arnie, and go back to where it started and back to Holland and talk more about your life away from football. But just give us your impressions on the championship so far. Obviously, you, you got five goals before you, you picked up your injury. What have you noticed as the main differences between your time in the Premier League to what you're facing now in the championship? <laughs> it's a tough league. <laughs> um, 
obviously playing uh, games back to back every Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. Um, it's quite difficult on its own because it's just a tough schedule. So um, that makes the way you play football makes makes it very interesting because you need to make sure the the team gets switched on in the right place. Uh, you need to get your body in the right place. Um, you have so many teams in this league that are uh, hand to ha uh, hand to hand with each other. Like it's so competitive, that makes it a very difficult league in my opinion. I would say, apart from the top five leagues in the world, I would say the championship comes right after it. Like it's so tough, uh, competitive. Um, I just saw in Holland, uh, Ajax won 13-0. I mean, you won't see those scores in the championship. So it's a very competitive league. You need, you, make sure, you need to make sure you're always switched on, even if you're playing against the teams that are at the bottom. So that makes it a very difficult league, in my opinion. Is that, do you think, a contributory factor to picking up your injury? The fact, the schedule, the intensity of Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. But um, yeah, on the other hand, I mean, I, I at this moment I have a minor injury and I think with the schedule we have, it's only reasonable if that makes any sense I think a lot of players will get injured every now and then in the playing the championship <laughs> so um, yeah you just need to make sure you get your body in the, in the best uh, place possible and uh, go forward from there how do you handle injuries we know about your faith of course and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly but how do you mentally deal with not just injuries but setbacks in life setbacks in football um, yeah I'm a Muslim I'm a religious so I get a lot of strength from my religion um, at this moment, for example, my mom, she comes to my place uh, because I live on my own. So that, that gets me like relaxed as well. Um, yeah, how do I deal with it? That's not, that's not really like a secret ingredient for me. I just, I just, I just get frustrated when I watch games. <laughs> I just don't watch games. <laughs> just don't watch games. <laughs> no, um, for me, I think what gets me calm is uh, knowing that uh, I'm focused on my rehab. Um, so I'll do every day the best I can to make sure that I get the best rehab possible to make sure I'm in the best place when I come back. And I think that gets me relaxed, just knowing that every day I'm doing the best I can to make sure that I'm best ASAP. How important are family to you? Because you mentioned there your mum, I know she, she lives over here now and she's obviously down visiting yeah. you as much as you can as well. I know you have a big family and they're dotted around here and in Holland <laughs> and, and whatever, but how important is that family values and connections to you as well as, as, as your off field, I guess, life? Um, Nah, my parents are my heroes. Um, like I'll respect them always. They are my heroes. Um, so I think in general, I mean, you should always take care of your parents. They did it for you when you're younger. So when they get older, you need to take care of them. Um, and that's what I try to do. Obviously not now because I'm injured. So the, <laughs> the roles have changed. But um, no, I think just in general, you should always take care of your parents. I mean, uh, they contribute greatly in life to anyone who was born on earth. And uh, you should always take care of your parents. Obviously, for you, you know, you've spoken before about your parents divorcing when you were very young, but I think you said subsequently that they have a very good relationship. How important is that to you? Um, no, very important. Um, I mean, my parents, they divorced when they, when they were younger. Um, that hasn't been an issue for me or my siblings at all. Um, but obviously, it's better if they, they get along good. Um, but on the other hand, you'll see in some households that parents stay with each other all, just in case, in in, in um, just be just just for the children, but I don't necessarily think that's a good idea because if your parents don't get along, you should just accept the fact that they don't and just keep a good relationship with them. So your mum's, you know, been down over the last few weeks over, you know, this year. She she doesn't live too far away. When you are out there, when you're not injured, does she like coming to games? Yeah, yeah. My whole family is uh, AFC Bournemouth addict. They uh, they watch all the games. <laughs> I think I watch less games than them <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Dream AFCB. Yeah, they watch the streams. They are they are on it. They are uh, literally uh, AFC Bournemouth addict. They need to know everything, every step. They're watching every game. Uh, so. Game? Are they the first to text you? First to first to talk to you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I get loads of calls now every day. Uh, how's the injury? You need to get back. Make sure you you get back better. The team needs you. They're winning, but you need to make sure when you come back, you need to, you need to be in the team. Blah 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 blah. So <laughs> <laughs> they are on it. They are on it. Yeah. Obviously, we've talked, you know, about your family and your faith on a match day when you when you are fit. What's it like, you know, being an AFC Bournemouth player coming in? You've got your prayer room right next to the yeah. the tunnel in the change room. What's your sort of match day routine? Um. Yeah, when I came in, they made a multi-faith prayer room uh, just next to the change room. And um, yeah, I highly appreciate it because that gives me uh, some sort of comfort before the game. Because as a Muslim, I need to pray five times a day and the times change every now and then. Uh, so it just takes a lot of my mind knowing that there's a place where I can just pray and relax for the game and make sure that I'm ready to go. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate it highly that the club did that for me. And um, before the games, I'll just always 
come in, relax, make sure I ate properly. And um, yeah, for me, my life is about football. So whenever there's a game, that's the that's the best day of the week. So I'm focused on the game and just make sure I want to perform on the pitch. I heard you say, Arnie, in a previous podcast I was listening to when preparing for this, that Bournemouth have been the best club in your career for accommodating your faith and, and making you oh, settle in from that point of view. Yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, throughout my career, there's no other club than Bournemouth that took care of me uh, to the extent they have been doing. So that's why. Some, some of the things they did for you when you came to accommodate you. Um, obviously, as well as the prayer room you mentioned. Obviously the prayer room. Um, but besides that, when I came in, um, Zayna was working at the time. Uh, so she sort of uh, praying math for me out. They uh, have a different prayer room at the training ground. It's not only in the stadium. Uh, the food uh, they made for me is halal as well. So they have been doing loads for me. Yeah. I was, again, reading and listening to some comments from you that just go right back to where it started. You said, as a, as a child, your friends maybe were going to the mosque, but you were football, football, football. <laughs> and you wish maybe now you, you went to the mosque with them instead. It, it, that's as much yeah. as, it, as strong as you, your faith is that back when you were younger, you actually wish you'd played less attention to football and more attention to your faith. Yeah, definitely. Um, because as I grew up, my faith become, became more important for me. Um, but obviously, football is my life. So um, being religious takes a bit of pressure off me, off, off me as well, because literally my life's based around, uh, around football. Um, so yeah, I think when I was younger, if I, if I would focus a bit more on my, my religion, I would be um, a bit further in my religion now. But obviously when I, came old, when I became older, I got more interested and I wasn't that interested when I was young. And all my friends were, but I was just kicking balls on the street 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, I, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing because that took me where I am today. But if I would go back, I might uh, have changed it a bit though, yeah. It took you to, to PSV as a, as a youngster ultimately, didn't it? 11, I think, is that right, when you joined yeah, PSV? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And then obviously went on to NEC when it didn't work out for you at, at PSV. PSV obviously is one of the giant names in Holland. I guess, how much is there, there a regret, if there is, that you didn't quite make that first team appearance at PSV and they, when it came to the crunch, they said, you're not for us? Um, yeah, I've had some ups and downs uh, in my career at PSV. Um, obviously, like my personality is I want to succeed everywhere I am. So uh, I had a couple of decisions um, at PSV. I had a couple of moments where I could leave the club, but I chose not to. That's because I'm always desperate to succeed wherever I am and I want to prove myself wherever I am. Um, so it was, a, it was a very tough and a hard decision for me at that time in my, in my life to go to a different club. Um, and I think, <laughs> if I can say it, so that PSV regrets, regrets it as well because I think I've proven quite a lot uh, already. Um, but for me, there are no regrets uh, with leaving PSV. I mean, um, they've done they've done good for me as well. It was a great time in my life, and I'm I'm really grateful for the period uh, of them taking care of me uh, in my life. But there are no regrets for me. I mean, I went to NEC, NEC and obviously had a had a great two years, and uh, they contributed great to my career as well. Obviously, when you left PSV, as you say, you went to NEC. How much for you did it sort of drive you to not necessarily prove PSV wrong, but make a point? And, and as you say, you always wanted to succeed. You always want to succeed. How much, you know, did that sort of rejection from PSV turn into motivation? Um, now, with me a lot. I mean, um, that's just the way my personality is. I want. I always want to prove people wrong that <laughs> think the wrong things about me. And I always want to... Um, like sort of back the arguments of people that think I'm a good player and I want to perform obviously and just um, let the world see what kind of player I am and I want to show my qualities on the pitch uh, to the world. So obviously PSV like not having the faith in me reaching the first team uh, that just gave me a stronger motivation and making sure that I would succeed, succeed in football and prove them wrong, yeah obviously. As Chris said, you know, you, you joined PSV age 11. How difficult was it to then acclimatise, if at all, to a different club because you'd been there for so many years and all of a sudden you're, you're moving and, and it's a different environment, a different setup? Um, for me, it wasn't that hard. Um, yeah, because as I said, my life is it's about football. So uh, wherever I go, I'm focused on football, playing football, making sure I perform, making sure I put the best, the best uh, performance on the pitch. So for me, like... Um, needing to get used to a different environment isn't really difficult for me because <laughs> I mean all the pitches are the same and my 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 goals are always the same I just need to make sure that the ball hits the net wherever I am so it's not, it's not very difficult for me to uh, to get used to a different environment now with NEC they got relegated then and for you that kind of saw you have a different lease of life you know they they went down a division and you seem to 
fly? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we went down at the vision um, and they changed uh, the coach at that time. And the coach that came then, Adri Bogus, was, a, in my opinion, is a, is a great coach. And uh, he helped me really move forward. Um, I liked working with him and he got the best out of me. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate him as a coach as well because he done a lot for me. What was it about him that was that made him so different, that made him stand out for you? Um, his way of training and his way of um, dealing with the lads. I mean, he was a coach that could really uh, deal one-on-one -on -one with the players. And I think I needed it at that time. Um, and besides that, he is a great coach in, in, in terms of the tactics and the way he wants to play. And that suited me at that time. And uh, I, could perform, I could perform really well under him. Yeah. Obviously moving from NEC to, to Bruges, geographically it's not too far, just across the border <laughs> into to Belgium. But how different was it moving to suddenly you're out of Holland for the first time? Um, yeah, again, wasn't it, 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 there, were, there weren't a lot of differences. I mean, uh, I came there, settled in quite fast, um, and I went to playing games. So it, for me, it, it isn't really difficult to get used to a different environment. I mean, I came there, got my house, um, lived there, and went to went training, kicked the ball, and made sure I perform. I mean, for me, it's about performing 24-7 wherever I am. So if it's in Holland, in Belgium, UK, China, I, I don't care. How much of a pleasant surprise was it for you, if it was at all, when suddenly a club like Bournemouth, because you hadn't played that many games for Bruges, had you really, before you, you came here, um, suddenly they want to pay £13 million for, for you. Um, how much did that pleasantly surprise you, that after so few games that the Premier League came calling? Um, <laughs> if I need to be really honest, um, I wasn't really surprised um, because I'd done really well that season. Um, yeah, And obviously with Bruges, we played Champions League. I performed well in the Champions League. Uh, played for the Dutch national team, uh, scored scored the goals, uh, scored goal, scored goal, scored a goal against Belgium. Uh, they were, I think, the number one country in the world on the on the table of nations. Um, so I wasn't really surprised. I mean, I done I done well um, just in a sh in a short time. <laughs> but that went down well with your Bruges teammates, the Belgian ones. Anyway, you scoring against Belgium? <laughs> yeah, they were pissed though. <laughs> And, and as um, as you say, that you're maybe not surprised and, and maybe you weren't such a familiar name to Bournemouth fans, but when you came in here, how does it change your mental, I guess, outlook as a player when suddenly you cost £13 million, pounds, a, a massive fee? Does that suddenly put that expectation, I guess, round your neck for people to, to sometimes use as a positive, sometimes use as a negative? Um, I think it certainly comes along with the expectation. But then again, I don't mind. I'm, I think it's reasonable if a club buys you for £13 million pounds that you need to perform. Um, so I kind of like the pressure that comes along with it because every club that will buy me, I will always want to. I always want to try and give them back um, what they deserve because obviously a club that buys you for a lot of money, they 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 buy you for a reason. So I always want to back the argument and make sure that I'm worth the money they're paying. I've got a quote from you here, which you said a couple of months after joining Bournemouth, you said, "I was firmly set on joining Bournemouth when I found out they they were interested in me." and for you, what was it about Bournemouth that made it so different? Why, why Bournemouth? Why did you want to come here? Um, like, obviously, this, the, like the the club isn't maybe it wasn't at the time wasn't maybe the biggest club in the Premier League. Um, and I, I had, to be fair, I had other options as well. Um, but with AFC Bournemouth, it was like it was a small club, but it was more of a family feeling. Um, um, the stadium isn't too big, but the fans are always always. Uh, giving their best for the club, so it's just like it—it it, it might not 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 have been the biggest club at the time in the Premier League, but it was just such a family feeling, uh, warm club, and I like that about the club. So for me, it was when AFC Bournemouth came in, like I knew straight away I wanted to go there. Did you speak to Nathan Ake before you joined? Obviously, being international teammate. Yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> and he gave me uh, a heads up. He was like, "Yeah, whatever your feeling is and the way you think about the club, that is a warm club. It's uh, it's like a family environment." He's like, "Yeah, I can, I can back that." And if you come here, you'll, you'll get the same feeling as me. It's a good club. Um, so he, he kind of helped me uh, coming here as well. I always get the impression <coughs> with you, you know, you, you and your teammates, you're so tight with each other. After a, a game on social media, when everyone's putting their posts up, you're the first one to comment and congratulate <laughs> your teammates on a, on a good performance. Does that come naturally to you? Um, yeah, we have some great guys in the, in the team. And um, for me, I think the better you are with your teammates off the pitch, the better you'll perform uh, on the pitch. I mean, you're 24-7 with each other in, in the end. I mean, you need to do it with the, with the lads in the, in the changing room. So I think it's better to have a good relationship with them because you'll perform better on the pitch as well. And uh, it comes natural as well. I mean, um, yeah, I'm on and off the pitch, I'm good with, with, with the lads. And it's, it's good that it comes natural. Make sure you perform with them better on the pitch.
You know, you had to wait a little while for your debut, obviously after you signed with a little bit of an injury, but you made your debut at Burton on a Wednesday night uh, in the League Cup when you lost to a lower division team. The floodlights <laughs> kept going out as well. You've just come from a team that's playing in the Champions League. Honestly, as you sat there watching the floodlights go out, are you thinking, what on earth am I doing here? What's happening? <laughs> I was thinking, I need to leave the club now. <laughs> now, uh, I can remember that game, yeah. Um, we should have won, to be honest. So I was pissed because it wasn't the best debut. Um, yeah, that, that game that game was a headache to be honest. Uh, I can't lie. That game was it was weird because the lights keep falling off and everything. We should have won. Uh, the gaffer was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> you remember it for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah, I remember it for the wrong reasons. But um, on the other hand, I was I was happy to make my debut. And for me, it's just a, an, an, uh, another um, achievement I reached in my in my life. Like okay, I debuted for I made a debut for the club. On to the next one. Only six starts, unfortunately, in the Premier League last season for you with, with injuries. Um, you were out from early December to the restart. You came back briefly and then you, you missed the run in as well. Um, how much of a difference do you think you could have made if, if you'd been a fitter last season? Do you think you could have? I mean, it sounds a horrible question to put to you, but could it have been the difference between staying up and going down? Um, nah, it's not a horrible question at all. Like, <laughs> I think I think if I, if I um, could have played more games, I think we would have stayed in the Premier League, if, I'm, if I need to be honest. I think I could have contributed a lot to the team. And I think um, if I played more games, we would have stayed in the Premier League. That's my, that, yeah, that's my opinion. How hard was it for you to, to watch, particularly having come back in the restart and things weren't going well in restart and then it just couldn't quite get going, could it? And it, it went to the wire, yeah. but you said you're not good at watching games. That must have been the hardest ever spell to watch games. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was very frustrating as well. Obviously, we weren't winning a lot of games. Um, I thought I should have played, um, and it was such a difficult time for the club because obviously you want to win, you want to win the game so badly, and I could see why the gaffer stick to his team because it's difficult changing a team uh, when you're under a lot of pressure and you want to perform, and you need to make sure that the club wins the games because otherwise you're gonna relegate. So it was a, it was a very weird and difficult time at the moment. Um, so for. For me, it was important to make sure that I wasn't a drag for the coach, if that makes any sense. So I just trained hard, make sure um, I put my head down and did everything the coach wanted because obviously no one wanted to relegate and me neither. So at that, at that, I think at that time of the season, it was just important for me to put aside all my pride and everything um, regarding me as an individual and just make sure I contribute to everything I could to the team. And in my opinion, I did, but in the end, it wasn't enough. Chris has mentioned that restart there, but for you, you know, being in and around the squad, how much of an impact do you think that that had? Because, you know, just before the break, we'd played quite well at Anfield, albeit not the result we wanted. We'd drawn 2-2 with Chelsea. It looked like performances were starting to pick up a little bit, but how much do you, th do you think that that break really had an impact? Um, I think it had a massive impact though, but I wouldn't use it as an excuse either. Um, I said it this season as well uh, to a lot of the lads, I mean, uh, last year, I can remember the first game against Sheffield, we drew. Um, I think we should have won that game. And there were so many games that we played in the Premier League, which we should have won or we shouldn't have lost. I mean, if you can't win, you just need to make sure you don't lose because it will get you a point. And in the beginning of the season, it seems like, ah, it's just a point or it's just, you, you, you'll get it right at the end of the season. But in my opinion, you should be on it and every game at the first start, at the first game of the season. So when this season started, the new season started and um, I knew I was going to play. So. Before I went out, uh, I made sure the lads knew, um, <laughs> even this season from the very first game, <clears throat> sorry, from the very first game, we need to make sure that we get all the points because the points you're winning at the beginning of the season might be uh, the ones that will take you to the Premier League at the end of the season. And we've seen how, just how tight it is at the top of that championship. So, you know, going into the start of the season with, with that in the forefront of your mind, it's so important, isn't it, to pick up every single point that you can. Yeah, 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 a hundred percent. You need to pick up every single point you can. I mean, in the end of the season, it might uh, it might be that point you needed to go to the Premier League. And um, I've seen it in my career already. We relegated with NEC um, on one point to less, and obviously uh, we relegated with Bournemouth, and that was tight as well. So it's it's a, it's a good life lesson learned for me. And I'm just and you just need to make sure it doesn't happen again in my career. <laughs> How hard for a player like you, and I think of similar players in the team like David Brooks and others, how hard is it to be consistent? How hard is it to be the flair player, making things happen every single week? Um, yeah, I can't speak for Brooksy, but for me, I don't find it hard at all. That's the reason I live. I, need, I want to make sure that I have an impact on the team. I want to make sure that I contribute to the team winning. So 
that's just normal for me if that makes any sense. I know when I step on the pitch, I know the club bought me for a massive fee and I need to make sure uh, I perform. I need to make sure that I still achieve the goals I want to achieve because obviously I'm ambitious as well. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it, it comes natural every day. Uh, I wake up and I train. I need to make sure I perform the best on the on the training pitch and make sure uh, that w when we're playing games that I perform that good as well. So it's it comes natural to me if that makes any sense. We talked about your debut, which maybe wasn't so memorable, but your first goal obviously was a little while coming against Blackburn on the opening day of the season. It won goal of the month uh, as well. It wasn't just a tap in. Um, <laughs> how much did that mean to you as well in terms of saying, right, I'm gonna, I'm not only gonna put get the assist in here and beat defenders, I'm gonna contribute some goals as well. When we got relegated, obviously everyone was pissed. Um, I went away, came back but I got my head in the right place and I just needed to make sure that this season um, I need to perform. So I came back uh, this season uh, after we got relegated, uh, did well, scored against Benfica in preseason, scored against West Ham in the preseason. Uh, competition started, scored against Blackburn, uh, scored goals, played well. So, I mean, I've been on it from day one and that's how I plan to go through the season. And just make, I just need to make sure that I perform every, every day in, day out. That's just the way I am. We'll come on to your international hopes and in getting back in the Holland setup uh, shortly. But what is the time scale in terms of you, when you feel like you need to be back in the Premier League or back in a top European league? Um, still yeah, I'm still young. Um, like obviously, I've played the Champions League already, and I've been there, so I know what it what it what it what it feels like to play there. So I'm very ambitious. I've always been, and I just want to get back to the top and, and perform there and show the world what I'm capable of. Um, so yeah, I basically I came here as well because of Nathan and he just left me like like that. <laughs> <laughs> so if so he's hearing selfish, this, isn't he? if he's hearing this, you're very selfish. <laughs> um, no, but obviously I'm ambitious and that's one of the reasons why I came to AFC Bournemouth because it's such a good club in um, having players make the next step and there are certain players that have proven it already and I just hope I can help the club getting back to the Premier League because that's the that's that's the main the main thing um, right now playing here, perform and make sure the club gets back to the Premier League. For Arnaut, do you as an individual, do you need to go back to the Premier League with Bournemouth to then be able to make another step, do you think? For me, it's about getting AFC Bournemouth back in the Premier League and what happens after that. I'm not really thinking about that at this moment, if it makes any sense. I mean, this club needs to go where it belongs. I mean, we've played Premier League uh, for five years, so I think the club needs to be up there and needs to go back there. We've, uh, we've just been talking about your contribution and, and your goals. I just want to ask you about your celebration. Every time you score, you sort of make a, a snake symbol with your hands. Just talk us through that. Where did that come from and, and what's that about? Um, so when I was younger, um, I played with a friend of mine and we always played five sides uh, on the pitch. And uh, it was a difficult time for us in our lives at that moment. So when um, it was difficult for us, we always just took a ball, went out on the, on, on the street and, and played five a side with a lot of friends. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, I always competed against him because at that time, like I was the best at my team, he was the best at his team. So whenever we were playing five a side, he was on the uh, on the other side. And um, when he used to win from me, he used to do that symbol against me, and it got me so pissed, got me so pissed. But we ended up being uh, the best friends at this moment. So um, when I score a goal, I like contribute the goal to him, and that's the reason I'm doing the celebration. Yeah. You're obviously still in touch with him. Yeah, obviously. And, you know, for you, those early memories from you to now be in stadiums, obviously, with just starting to get fans back, to be able to celebrate in front of the fans and, and you know, stamp your mark on it, that must be very special. Yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, I came back scoring a lot of goals and uh, no fans <laughs> in the stadium. <laughs> so I've kind of been celebrating uh, uh, for the camera instead of the fans. But I, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the, the fans being back. They've been back already, but obviously I haven't been on the pitch. But I, um, I really want to play with the fans. I mean, I've, I've missed the f that, that feeling. Yeah, definitely. You speak about, you know, celebrating in front of the camera. It's been absolutely brilliant because when you scored this season, you seem to have <laughs> clocked where the AFCB TV cameras are. You've come yeah, straight well, over. I've got a feeling of it now, yeah. <laughs> is it, are you aware of where they are before the game or is it just kind of instinct moment? I've scored. Nah, I think that they're, they're, they're always on the same place. I mean, they're always, when I, when I score, I always look left. If they're not there, they're on the right. So <laughs> they're either left or right from the goal. And now we know that your family are watching the stream very closely. You're effectively celebrating directly to them, aren't you? I <laughs> yeah, really as well. Nah. I need to be careful what I say on the commentary now that I know your family. <laughs> Yeah, they're the hearing stream, every word then. you're saying, every word, I promise you. <laughs> I'm surprised you've turned up. Um, just You mentioned there growing up and, and going back. Um, we know you've spoken about it quite a lot before, and I know you've said every single interview people ask you about the start. In terms of how your start compared to where you are now, do you feel like you had to overcome a lot when you when you got started, even getting as far as FC Ursa, your first team, or getting to PSV? In terms of your life and 
Um, yeah, 100%. Um, I've had to overcome a lot, but then again, um, I think like the the strongest soldiers overcome the strongest battles. So I don't necessarily see it as a, as a burden. I see it more as a blessing in my opinion because it made me the person I am today and because I need to over, overcome a lot of things. I mean, that made me stronger today. And I think, um, I think it's only good that through life you go through a lot because it makes you stronger and it makes sure like I'm mentally prepared for whatever comes my way. It helps me on the pitch. Um, I want to win 24-7. It, for me, it's about winning, winning, winning. Um, and I think I became this way because I need, needed to overcome a lot of things. Do you think you got treated differently when you were maybe younger because of maybe the background or some of the things that you had going on in your family? I've read some comments about you getting having to get the train or getting a lift to training where <laughs> everybody else was driving yeah. flashy cars. Do you think you got treated differently? Uh, 100%, without a doubt. Um, is it fair? No. Um, did I need to get along with it and get the best out of it? Yes, I mean, life is unfair for whatever reason. And um, I've, always been, I've always been that way. I mean, I know life is unfair, but um, instead of sitting in the sofa and just watching a lot of series, I think I can better stand up and make sure I make the best of my life. And you say now that a lot of the things you do to help other people and to inspire other people are because maybe you felt like you didn't get as much help from certain people, maybe in the footballing world, when you were growing up as you felt like you should have done. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I appreciate life uh, because I need to go through a lot of things uh, that changed my view on the world and it changed my perspective. Um, so wherever I am in my in my life, I always try to help other people as well. I mean, um, even if I say it myself, um, there are a lot of things that I do off the pitch, um, try to help other people where no one knows about because I kind of never tell anyone because I, I feel then it's for the, the, the wrong reasons. I mean, I can go on this podcast and tell all the good things I've been doing but then I'll just do it to get myself hyped and that's not the reason I've been doing I generally want to help other people and make sure they get set in life as well and of course people assume that with status and with with money and being a top level footballer that life is rosy and life is everything that you see on social media but of course it isn't and that every player has their problems yeah. either football injuries whatever is that something is that a misconception that because everybody is a person that if you have money and you have status that you don't have any problems no that's uh that's a very wrong statement, 100%. I mean, um, in my opinion, materialistic things, uh, money, cars, everything, uh, you can name it. Um, there's no end to it. I mean, if that's your life and goal, you will, you will, you will end up on a road which has no end. There's no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel if you, if you chase cars or you chase money because there will, there, there will always be more money. If you have a million, you want two million. If you have two million, you want a billion. So for me, it's about uh, making sure what you appreciate in life and that will keep you on the right path, definitely. Mm -hmm. In terms of your background, obviously it, it was tough for you at times when you were growing up. Does that help keep you grounded now? Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, because because what I've went through changed my perspective and the way I see things in life. Uh, that keeps me definitely grounded now and um, appreciate a lot of things in life which I didn't used to appreciate, if that makes any sense. So definitely my, my view has changed since I'm younger and uh, that helps me at this time in my life as well. Do you ever sort of, you know, think back to those times and, and you see yourself now, you're out there, you've been playing in the Premier League, you're obviously playing in the Championship this season. That must make you feel immensely proud seeing where you've come from and, and where you are now. Um, yes and no. Um, it makes me proud because I always appreciate where I am at life. Um, but then again, as I said, um, <laughs> um, I'm very ambitious, very, very, very ambitious. Um, uh, I play for the Dutch national team, which still burdens me because um, I didn't have a great season last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm desperate of getting back there as well. And I'm doing everything I can on the pitch. And um, I'm confident I'll get back there. Uh, I play Champions League. I want to go back there as well. Um, last year, I didn't perform for the club as I think I, I could. Um, not necessarily because I, I, I couldn't, but yeah, the injuries just set me back. Um, so. I would say yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm still very ambitious. Um, I'm grateful and I'm thankful where I'm now. Um, I'm at a good place. I'm at a good club, uh, a good league to show myself in. We have a, a great staff, uh, one of the best staff I've worked in in my life, and that's 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 no lie. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm in a great place. But then again, I'm so ambitious and there's so much I want to achieve. So I'm I'm definitely not done yet. In terms of internationally. I think me and Chris were talking before, you know, about players that have been called up for Holland. Tim Krul, for example, yeah. he's playing in the championship and, and he's still getting <laughs> that call up. So <laughs> You know what you... pissed me off though? <laughs> <laughs> so that same week when he got called up, 
I scored a goal against him. So why am I not gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> so you should have been called up. But for no. you, you know, seeing seeing the seeing Tim Krul getting called up and playing in the same same yeah. league as him, it obviously goes to show that that you know yeah, the yeah, Holland yeah. scouts no, are, it's, are it's, watching it's, the, I was, the game. I was to be fair, I was buzzing that he got called up because that means they're they're watching the league, and I think they should because the championship is definitely definitely tougher than the than the Dutch league. I mean, that's that's no comparison. If if any club wins here 13-0 or 6-0, I'm quitting. <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, it, there's, the, the, the league is so much better in, in so many ways, so much tougher, so much difficult. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they, that, that they are watching the league, obviously. I'm just not happy that they haven't called me up yet. <laughs> it's meant to be slightly worried hearing that if Bournemouth tonks somebody, you're going to quit because they score five <laughs> against Huddersfield. So the form you're in at the minute as a team, they're going to be a bit worried you're off. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned the Holland situation there, obviously. Um, did you have a tough choice between Holland and Nigeria, or was it uh, a straightforward one? Because obviously you um, were you left Nigeria when you were very young, but your mum is Nigerian. Yeah, my mum is Nigerian, but um, like I've always been in charge of my own choice. There's no family pressure. There's no pressure at all. Um, they always told me choose where you where your heart belongs. And um, at the moment when I could play for Holland. Um, I was more than happy to play for Holland, and I'm still more than happy to play for Holland. Um, obviously, if I need to be honest, I think the rules have changed. Uh, if you have one cap, you can still switch, and uh, there will be a certain time in my career where I have maybe might need to make a choice and change scenery, if that makes any sense. Uh, but at this moment, um, knowing that they called up Tim Crow, they're watching the league, um, I'll just I'll just need to make sure I do all, and I'm confident I'll get back in there 100%. We're pretty much out of time, Arnie, but we have got a couple of quick-fire fans questions, so these are nice, short, sharp ones. Yeah. Um, I'll give you the first one. Would you rather play alongside a prime Lionel Messi or prime Cristiano Ronaldo? Ronaldo. Okay. That answers that one. Who? What is your favourite position on the pitch? That one's from Danny Whitelock. Um... I would say left winger, but I don't mind playing at, uh, at top as well, or number ten, or a bit more to the to the right. I don't I don't mind, but if I would say a favourite position, that would be left wing, definitely. Oliver Reed, we've already asked you a question about the goal celebration. Cheryl on Twitter wants to know what is the best goal you've scored in your career. The best goal, um, I would say, the goal against Atletico Madrid, um, or the goal with the Dutch national team against Belgium, um, but. Maybe the goal with AFC Bournemouth against Blackburn. Oh, well saved, well saved. <laughs> you got some angry faces over this, so I need to mention that. <laughs> and there's one from James here. How powerful is it when you take the knee before a game and how important is it to support? support um, it's this? very powerful. I think it shows, uh, it shows um, a lot of respect to the, to the black community. But on the other hand, um, I'm, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I don't necessarily think that contributes a lot to what's going on right now I think if there's if if they if, they, if there needs to be a change I think the only way of making a massive change is you just need to make sure that the, the next generation get educated in the right way I don't necessarily think taking a knee would change a lot of the situation in the world but it is definitely a strong feel yeah definitely Arnie, we're, we're bang out of your time, I know, so I just wanted to say on behalf of the fans who've been listening to this, it's been really interesting to get a, an insight into the dressing room and into your life and, and backstory as well. So thank you so much for talking to us. Likewise, thank you a lot for inviting me on the podcast. Well, Zoe, how good was that to be taken inside the dressing room just to get a view on the, the current situation, obviously the frustrations of Arnie's injuries. And of course, somebody who's got really such an interesting backstory as he has and how he got here to Bournemouth in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, in episode one, we, we got a perspective from you know, someone higher up in, in the club and, and to go inside the dressing room now, it's a it's a fantastic insight. And to have him for, for the amount of time that we did, you know, we, we used to talking to players after a game or before a game in, in three or four minute snippets. So to have him for, you know, the best part of 45 minutes has, has been brilliant. I think that's one of the beauties of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast is that we are able to get beyond those, you know, me and you do it all every single week. We do the pre-match or the post-match interviews where it's all always a little bit of a rush. Players' emotions are either running high or low. You know, there might be some mowers going off in the background. It's so good to be able to just sit down and just talk at length isn't it with people and, and just hear a little bit more about them because often people are names on score sheets their names on team sheets on the back of their shirt but actually people have such good backstories absolutely and and when we're talking to them after a game we're so often talking about the game you're not ever talking about their background or you know their their international career you're talking about what's happened there and then so to be able to have a perspective of someone like Arnaut Danjim who's played for his country he's played he's obviously from a different country he's played in in Belgium and you know it's a, it's a fascinating insight and and amazing 
to hear, you know, where he wants to go with his career and how ambitious he really is. And we're all football fans, of course, first and foremost. So it's always great to hear a little bit more of the, the characters behind the names on the faces that uh, you've become so familiar with. Worth pointing out as well that Arnie's rehab, of course, is a top priority at the moment. So this one a little bit shorter than our previous podcast with Arnie's rehab um, schedule, if you like, uh, giving us the time available that we had. Don't forget if there's a particular player or member of staff or somebody at the club that you would like to hear from, then don't forget to let us know and uh, use the hashtag AFCB pod. Don't forget to mention and to share us on your social media channels as well, to, including who you'd like to see on the podcast in future and maybe some questions or reasons why you'd like to see them on. And don't forget also to subscribe wherever you're listening as well to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. It's afcb.co.uk for all the club updates on upcoming matches as we head through the very busy festive schedule. And of course, you'll be able to find out when you can listen to the next edition of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. You can continue to watch the games live, of course, via your match pass on AFCB TV live. In the meantime, we hope, though, to see you back here at the stadium very shortly. From myself, Chris Temple, from Zoe Rundle, and from our guest, Arnout Danjuma, thanks for listening and wish you a very happy Christmas.